Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer on the doors of perception. <laughs> the good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. <sighs> Toxicology, astro seismology, magnetism, the dark side, genetically engineered potatoes, planetoid, planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> this episode was first broadcast in 2010. Welcome to Diffusion, the international science show. Relax and enjoy the sensation of your mind expanding while we pour it into your brain. My name's Lachlan Watmore, and in this edition, Market West will present photic sneezing. Ian Wolfe will go back to Dorkbot and talk to a man called Lee Russell about non-Newtonian fluids. I'm going to talk about Vladimir Putin and a whole bunch of other people, and there'll be lots and lots of weird and wonderful science in between. But first up, we've got the news. Russian Prime Minister and all-round he-man Vladimir Putin didn't do his scientific credentials any favours recently when he questioned human impact on global warming. Just before he took to the water off the Kamchatka Peninsula to shoot a whale with a crossbow, Mr Putin was visiting a Russian-German research station at the mouth of the Lena River in the far eastern Yukatia River region in the Arctic Ocean. He was shown 3,000-year-old chunks of ice and a few mammoth bones, and as he sat down to tea with the scientific team, he mused that mammoths had been made extinct by climate change that was not human-made but perfectly natural, if you take into account the fact that the Earth is in a constant state of flux, and that all those mammoths must have put out a lot of methane. Therefore, mused Mr Putin, isn't climate change simply part of the natural cycle? A German scientist called Inken Proust quickly set him straight, stating that human-made emissions made those dropped by mammoths look like just a lot of broken wind, and that human-influenced global warming works at a much, much faster rate. This isn't the first time that Mr Putin has thrown in his two kopecks about climate change. In 2003, he suggested that a global warming of 2 or 3 degrees wouldn't be such a bad thing, because Russians would no longer have to wear fur coats, and the annual harvest would be greater. Russia herself has come under criticism for not introducing a carbon reduction scheme. This is rebutted by Moscow on the basis that the Russian economy still needs to grow after 70 years of Soviet stagnation. However, Russia has had her share of global warming impact, with recent crop failures producing a shortfall in production and terrible forest fires, fuelled by hot winds which themselves are generated by what appears to be a stalled jet stream. This has led to a doubling of the daily death rate in Moscow due to respiratory problems from all the smoke. Oh, by the way, Mr Putin was only shooting the whale, a grey whale, to collect a skin sample using a specially adapted dart on the end of a string. The Prime Minister is actually quite a conservationist when he's not riding around bare-chested on a horse. Avoid eating grapefruit and drinking grapefruit juice while being treated with this medicine. Some time ago I heard a rumour that grapefruit juice could make coffee seem stronger and that it could make the contraceptive pill stop working. Not being a coffee drinker, I thought that the second effect sounded more interesting and was worth investigating, so I immediately started asking questions of medical and pharmaceutical experts. None of them seemed to know any details about the metabolic pathways of the contraceptive pill, so I was left with that wonderful instrument of literature search, the World Wide Web. The ability of grapefruit to affect medication was first found by accident in the late 1980s during clinical trials on a blood pressure drug called philodipine. Grapefruit juice was being used to mask the taste of the drug in one group of patients, and much higher drug concentrations were found in their bloodstreams. Follow-up studies have confirmed that both grapefruit pulp and juice can increase the bloodstream concentrations of a wide variety of drugs by as much as nine times. The mechanism seemed to be that grapefruit juice increases the absorption of these drugs through the gut wall, and also that it blocks the liver's processing of the drug, so that the drug stays in your bloodstream for longer and in higher concentrations than normal. I was able to find highly technical descriptions that threw around names like cytochrome P450 and CYP3A4 enzymes, while admitting that they weren't really sure of the complete mechanism of keeping drugs in your system stronger and for longer. There's a huge list of medications to be wary of. Tranquilizers, such as benzodiazepines, heart disease calcium channel blockers, digestive aids, such as prepulsed, 
non-sedating antihistamines like claritine, anti-cholesterol statin drugs, immunity-blocking drugs for transplant patients, epilepsy drugs, and the one I came looking for, estrogen, as found in the oral contraceptive pill, ethinylestradiol. Now, I was almost sidetracked by case histories of people on blood pressure medicine keeling over when the blood concentration went up nine times past their prescription, but I still noticed a problem. How on earth could an oral contraceptive fail if the grapefruit juice made it stronger in your system? Once again, I tried the experts, but nobody would admit to enough understanding to either rule it out as a myth or to explain how it could happen. So I got cleverer with my internet searches. I found an article explaining how researchers now plan to use the grapefruit effect to allow patients to take lower doses of drugs and so experience less toxic side effects, which they believe will be especially promising for HIV patients. It also saves money by allowing you to take lower doses of expensive drugs. The University of Michigan Medical Center have done research that shows that people vary widely in the levels of cytochrome P450 enzymes they have in their system, and that people have widely varying tolerances for medications affected as a result. Their finding is that the grapefruit juice actually brings everybody to the same level. They suggest that this level be a base standard level, and that everyone drink grapefruit juice two hours before the medication affected, so that an identical dose of the drug prescribed will have an identical effect. This still wasn't telling me how grapefruit juice drinking could get a woman pregnant, unless it was highly fermented. Then I started finding references to an effect on a morning after emergency contraceptive drug, where there are unintended pregnancies. Researchers from the University of California at San Francisco have found quite separately from the cytochrome P450 interaction that keeps drugs in your systems for longer, grapefruit juice activates a protein ejection mechanism which actually pushes the drug molecules right out of the intestinal wall and back into the intestine, stopping them from being absorbed. There is again a whole list of drugs used to treat cancer, hypertension, allergies and heart disease that can be blocked from absorption this way. And also a drug called levonorgestrel, which is used as an emergency morning after contraceptive. Digging deeper showed that many modern preventative oral contraceptive pills contain both the artificial estrogen and levonorgestrel, not just the morning after variety. So what can happen is that women who drink grapefruit juice and take the combined version of the pill will have their estrogen levels rise but won't absorb much of the levonorgestrel, which normally works by stopping fertilized eggs from implanting. So the contraceptive doesn't get absorbed and women could become pregnant when they believe they're protected. And caffeine? Well, the researchers are still arguing over that one. Early studies show it increased caffeine in the blood, more recent studies showed no change at all. The recommendation is if you already drink grapefruit juice or eat grapefruits for breakfast regularly, don't stop. However, if you don't normally consume grapefruits or grapefruit juice, and you take oral contraceptives or any of our shopping list of drugs from antidepressants to heart disease medications, then just don't start on the stuff. You're listening to Ian Wolf on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. Ian Wolfe went to Dorkbot, people doing strange things with electricity, and met Lee Russell, a technological artist. Lee Russell electrolyzes water into hydrogen and oxygen to blow up a condom like a balloon and then sets off the explosion which creates an electromagnetic pulse that reboots a nearby computer. He also has a perspex tube with a speaker at each end. This is filled with little foam beads that can be made to move by sound and show the shapes of the sound waves. Finally, he turns potato starch powder and water into a non-Newtonian fluid sitting on a speaker. When he puts sound through the speaker, the fluid comes alive and, and tries to climb out of the speaker. Try and visualise this as you hear this story. There will be videos of these demonstrations on www.diffusionradio.com. Four, three, two, one. You've got several things you're showing us at Dogbot tonight. Yep. Do you want to run through them quickly? Yes, the uh, first thing is 
My hydrogen, or well, the first and last thing, is a hydrogen and oxygen generator, which is called an electrolyzer. It breaks down water into its constituent parts, which is one part oxygen, two parts hydrogen, and it uses electricity to do that. And yeah, so that. Well, I'm inflating a condom with that, with the gas, and then igniting it. And when it burns, it, I believe it creates a magnetic pulse via shedding electron rings in the explosion. And I'm attempting to shut a computer down. First attempt was unsuccessful. I think there was too much air in the in the electrolyzer cell, so the gas was impure. Now, about three years ago, I built this thing. Essentially, all it is is an electrolyzer. You can put a voltage. Um, DC voltage across some plates um, into water, put an electrolyte to make the water conductive, and you get two parts hydrogen off one of the electrodes, and on the other one you get um, one part oxygen, and that's like a flammable mixture. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it can be dangerous, but <laughs> When I first built my, my first cell, I um, I was quite, you know, excited about exploding balloons full of hydrogen and oxygen. So I ran into my friend's room and um, I was like, yeah, yeah, let's just blow some stuff up and um, <laughs> as you do. And I, um, yeah, we, we, I blew this balloon up and his computer shut down, blue screen of death. And we were like, that's really weird. So I did some um, research on the internet and what I found out was that when hydrogen and oxygen combust they they shed electron rings as part of the reaction and um uh, that was an electromagnetic pulse that that shut its computer down now this is my latest cell um should we remove all electronic devices from the room no it, it's quite a localized um, <laughs> <laughs> if anyone has a Outside. Um, <laughs> I also have earplugs. This is for the, if anyone's got hot heart, any problems, they're scared, just be outside because it's an allowed explosion. It's yeah, but your mobile phones, laptops should be fine because they're, they're like self-contained. This computer, it's got it's got keyboard and it's got a mouse and it's got like power to the grid and all that copper wire. It absorbs the shock and it just sends erroneous messages to the. CPU and it just goes, I don't understand what, what's going on and it shuts down. <laughs> um, sometimes it doesn't work, sometimes it completely shuts down, sometimes it's blue screen. Alright, now it's armed. Okay, four, three, two, one. Secondly was my synthesizer modules that I've been building, analog synthesizer modules that are 16 step sequencer made using my CNC router and my CNC router has made the circuit boards and the panels and cut everything out and will be making the, the body. So that's a cutting tool? CNC router, CNC stands for Computer Numeric Control and any, any power tool can be controlled by a computer via the, this method. So this is just like a router, which is like a wood router or whatever and it can move in three dimensions, X, Y, and Z. So you can cut out things out of wood or out of a block of, of material. And I've used, also showed a few other objects that I've made using my router. And as you would have seen, my 16-step sequencer was controlling my one a synthesizer, which I did not make. It's a Roland System 100M. And with that synthesizer, I also showcased a glass tube with a speaker at both ends full of foam. I don't know what to call it, the thermalizer. It's kind of <laughs> like a, Ru a Rubens tube. And when you put an oscillator through it, it creates interesting patterns in the foam. You get to see the, the, the audio wave, and that's um, what you saw when I... <laughs> and then the next thing was demonstrating non-Newtonian fluid which I just used potato starch and water and that was directly applied to a speaker cone once again I'm modulated by my um, synth again and yes alien crazy alien tentacles is all I can say it to was explain. amazing yes now um, non-Newtonian fluid is what this is called um, I don't know if anyone's ever played with cornstarch or um, if anyone doesn't know what happens, it's, it's liquid and it's 
knee is your blood pressure, it gets stiff and hard. And if you use, if you've got like a kid's pool, you fill it with cornstarch and water, you can run across it and it's like running across cement. As soon as you stand still and stop moving, you sink straight into it. Um, and there's, there's YouTube videos of people doing that in big swimming pools and stuff. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah, check this out. It's so awesome. Um, so yeah, and this is just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah I guess that's everything and I guess now I'm about to go back and try and blow up and you have actually seen this crash a computer before yes I've crashed my computer uh, about maybe I've done it four times now I tried unsuccessfully three times on a laptop didn't do anything but um, I have successfully crashed a computer quite a few times uh, I guess a um, tower computer I guess and right. this computer I have is a piece of crap <laughs> I don't care what happens to it. So. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. And you're also using 3D printing. Oh yes, I've been doing 3D printing, getting stuff 3D printed. Um, Shapeways is a website um, that you can get things printed. It's probably the best place I've found and works very well. It's cheap. Um, they really got their stuff together. And yeah, the results, as you saw, were amazing. Like 3D printing's come a long way, and it's pretty good stuff. Well, <laughs> people want to see more of your work. Do you have a website or somewhere they can look? I don't have a website. It's on the way. It's been on the way for like 10 years. So they should just Google you and look for the images. In the <laughs> on YouTube, if, yes. you, if you type in sound wave tube, you may find my tube. It's up there. Um, yeah, so unfortunately I, I'm too lazy to put stuff on. I don't have a website. Maybe. That's alright. Yeah. Hey Russell, thank you very much. Here's a tooth and throat singer moving the beads with the power of his voice in the tube and then moving the non-Newtonian fluid sitting on the speaker. That was Ian Wolfe talking with Lee Russell at Dorkbot. You can see the videos of Lee Russell's demonstrations on www.diffusionradio.com and look for Dorkbot in your local city. In the laboratories of your name here, there is a modest sign. And here, dedicated scientists face the challenge. Years of heartbreaking failures and setbacks only stiffened their resolve to conquer the problem. And one day, a strange and historic accident. Uh-oh. Well, you did it again. Gee, what a mess. Oh, well. Wait a minute. Maybe... Listen. Hi, Gad. Do you suppose this freak accident... Of course. That's it. That's the answer. We've done it. After all these years, we've invented it. How about that? Oh, no, no. That's no kind of a thing to say. This has got to be some sort of a line that'll get quoted, like, uh... Well, how about this? What has God wrought? Good. Good. Beautiful. Let me get that down. And with those historic words, the search was over. From the laboratories of your name here had come the key to the secret that had baffled man through the ages. No longer a dream, but a reality was your product here. Now, for the first time, limitless horizons open for the nation. A brighter future unfolded. Thanks to your name here. Employment boom. Geared to supply this vital new industry that is reshaping our economy and transforming the lives of millions. 
And now we've got something from the mailbag, and I'm going to throw this question to Ian because he knows about this sort of thing. Mind you, there's very little that Ian doesn't know about. We all know that sunlight is good for us. How good is sunlight for you if you're sitting behind a pane of glass? Well, that's a really good question because if you're indoors mm. but you're sitting in the sun because it's streaming through the windows, you would hope that you know all that sunlight, it feels good, it looks good, it should be good for you. But unfortunately, to make vitamin D, your skin needs ultraviolet. And the ultraviolet helps your body turn cholesterol in your blood into vitamin D. And the glass blocks all of the ultraviolet light. All and of it? All of it. Really? blocks the infrared and the ultraviolet and just lets through the visible light. So the infrared is why it's good in a greenhouse, because it keeps the heat in. Yes. The ultraviolet means you can use it to protect yourself from lasers if you're playing in a laboratory. Yes. And it stops your sun burning, which is good, yes. but it also stops you from getting vitamin D. So you need to go outside, which is why all the public health announcements talk about going outside to get your sunlight. How absolutely fascinating. Well, we hope you've enjoyed that answer to that question. And a big thank you to Matthew Hall, who wrote in and asked for that information. The next question we're going to answer today is, why do I sneeze at the sun from Lisa Bailey in Adelaide? And I actually also suffer from this affliction. It's actually called photic sneezing. And I spoke to Professor Lewis Patek from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, who studies neurogenetics. And the first thing I asked him was, is it real? Uh, it's absolutely real. And it's a phenomenon where people, after being in relative darkness for a certain amount of time, walking out into bright light or turning on a bright light will lead them to sneeze usually the same number of times each time they go through that cycle. And it may be once or twice or three times or more. And we really don't understand why it happens, but there's no question that it's a real phenomenon. And it's appears to affect perhaps as many as 10% of the population. And it appears that it's a genetic trait that's passed on from people who have it to 50% of their children on average. Well, is, is it in any way related to hay fever or smelling pollen, that sort of thing? Oh, no, completely different. Is it, is it something that we've evolved to do, or do you think it's a byproduct of something else? I can't think of a selective advantage of sneezing when you go from dark to light. But I also can't think of a selective disadvantage, again, unless you were flying an airplane at, at a Mach 1 and the light coming through the trees led you to sneeze and you tipped the controls and crashed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I can't think of any example where sneezing in that setting would actually help you. When you sneeze from a cold or hay fever or dust in the air, that's really more of a protective response. You may have inhaled some pollen or dust that's irritating the inside of your nose or, or your or airways. And so a sneeze often allows you to just blow all that stuff out, clean out some of the stuff that you may have inhaled that is causing some discomfort for your, your nasal mucosa. Is it associated with age or sex? I know it's genetic, so if, if, if your parents have got it, you've got a higher chance of getting it. But is it associated with any other factors? Not that we know of. Because it's not a disease, it, you know, if people were dying from this, then, of course, we would know a lot more about it because a lot of people would study it. But it doesn't seem to be a good thing or a bad thing. It just happens that about 10% of the population do it. It comes on in childhood and often is lifelong. I think I read somewhere that there's a theory that maybe there's some short circuit going on in your brain with the optic nerve triggering the, the sneeze response. Is that is that possible? It kind of sounds speculative. Well, it's completely speculative. Whether it could be some short circuit or, or you know an abnormal connection somewhere in the brain or brain stem, that, that seems perfectly plausible and intuitively pleasing as an explanation, but there's zero data in support of that and zero data refuting that. I, I simply can't say anything other than, yeah, that sounds sort of like an attractive idea, but we simply don't know is the bottom line. Contributing to this program were yours truly, Lachlan Watmore, Mark West and Ian Wolfe. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Are you a scientist, artist, biohacker or maker who'd like to be interviewed about your work? Would your company like to sponsor Diffusion? 
Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. Please subscribe to the Diffusion Science Radio channel on youtube.com slash c slash diffusion radio and rate the show on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 28 stations on the community radio network, including Radio Blue Mountains 89.1 FM in New South Wales, 8 Triple C in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2 MVR in Nambucca Valley, 3 MBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia, City Park Radio 7 LTN in Launceston, Tasmania, and 2 XFM in Canberra. Diffusion is narrowcast on Indigo FM 88 in northeast Victoria. Diffusion is syndicated globally on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com. And check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, you can explore more than a thousand previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com, where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Make a donation through paypal.me slash ianwolf or join my patrons at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. I'm Ian Wolf. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know, and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the Earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick. Everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. Knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography. Collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.